after spending the past few months rebuilding the broken engine on the cheapest Mini Cooper S in the country, it's finally time to get it back in. Before we get into things, make sure you give this video a like and let's do it. Okay then, so a couple of things to point out before we get started. This engine mount, it is the original engine mount, it's just been cleaned up, it's just had a good uh, sandblasting along with this engine mount bracket here. But obviously I have installed the PowerFlex engine mount insert on that which should stiffen things up a little bit. This pipe here, this fuel hose, this has been replaced for a brand new one. This was the original one, I guess, when the previous owner swapped out the high pressure fuel pump, they damaged the end of it. And um, yeah, I didn't really want to reuse one with a damaged end, so I just cut that off when it came to uh, engine removal. The heater matrix that has all been flushed through, just got a hose on there, flushed it through until we had clear water out of there. So no old coolant or debris left in the entire cooling system. And then when it comes to the clutch master cylinder, as you can see, the old one is still in place. I'll probably get the engine in and then bolt the new one to the gearbox and then we'll disconnect it and then obviously the entire system needs to be bled so yeah I'll deal with that after but I think now the engine and gearbox is ready to go back in. Is that side in yet, that side? Um, I mean, it's just like, it's, because obviously it's too high, can't go in like that, can it? Okay then, so, as you can see, the engine is kind of in the right position inside of the engine bay, but it's been a little bit of trial and error, back and forth, trying to find out the best method of getting this engine in place. Now, I'm pretty sure you could very easily just, you know, push it right into place and it would go in, you, do, you know, just t tighten down both of the nuts and away you go. But because this is a fully rebuilt engine, I have lots of nice new shiny parts on this thing. I don't want to damage anything, so I have definitely taken my time and I found the best method of getting this engine and gearbox in position is to remove the right side or I guess left side passenger side uh, transmission mount bracket and I also removed the mount on the transmission itself just to allow me to get it in straight because ideally you want this engine and gearbox to go in straight because it is very very tight against the set against the chassis leg so you're not going to really be able to get it in at an angle so yeah I took this uh, bracket off as you can see I've reinstalled the bolts torqued down the um, all four of them to 38 newton meters so that is now back on this mounting bracket can go on as well or well, that way around it should be and then of course I can then install the nut so then as you can see this mounting bracket is now torqued down those three bolts are 56 newton meters also made sure that the clutch pipe and the master cylinder is in the correct location underneath i did just remove the master cylinder that's why there's some brake fluid in there and i just uh, reinstalled i do actually have a new one a new master cylinder to go on as i've mentioned already um, but i'll do that once the uh, once the engine's all buttoned up and went somewhere uh, once i'm ready to bleed the system but i think now it's just a case of talking down the two main engine mount nuts i was thinking about reinstalling the rear one where the uh, engine mounts to the subframe but i think that'll get get in the way of the drive shaft so yeah i'm just going to torque these two down now i think this one then this one has to be torqued down to i think it's 38 newton meters then an angle torque and the other one that's just a just a uh, a torque setting so i'm just going to take the weight off of the engine hoist hopefully it doesn't just plummet to the ground 
uh, where it's off it now. I'm going to torque this nut down to 40 newton meters first, not 38, which it already is. And then this one down to 100, I believe. That's 100 newton meters for this one. There we are. And I can torque down the transmission side nut to a further 105 degrees. So, engine should now be securely in place. And we should be able to go ahead and remove this engine hoist. And now with the engine safely mounted in the car, I guess now it is the painful task of connecting up any electrical connectors, any coolant hoses, any vacuum pipes into the correct position. Oh, we have the fuel pipe to the high pressure fuel pump as well that needs to go on. And yeah, just uh, really start buttoning things up. And then we can move on to, of course, oh, drive shafts, can't forget that, rear engine mount. And then once everything's buttoned up, now of course, front end can go back on. So then we have been busy. What have we done? So, so far we have everything on this side, the transmission side of the engine, completely buttoned up, I think. So of course, ECU and the fuse box is back in. Now, I think when maybe a previous owner has been in here before, they kind of twisted the wires around the, the wrong way. So I was a little bit confused. It's really tight to get this back in. So I actually channeled the cables the correct way and they sit much better now. It's much easier to move this thing around. It just means that everything is in the correct orientation. So yeah, sorted all that out. Obviously uh, ECU uh, cover and the uh, fuse box all back in. That is all now screwed back into position. Of course, all plugged back in as well to the engine and the um, gear linkage, that is all now back on. Just applied a small amount of grease to the uh, ball end on both of those. Uh, that sensor down there, that goes into the gearbox. Don't know if it's a reverse switch or a gear position sensor, but yeah, that's plugged back in as well. We have this cable that goes down to the power steering rack motor. That's plugged back in. There is this uh, vacuum pipe which goes to the intake manifold. Don't know if you can see that. But that is plugged back in as well. This uh, fuel pipe, I'm going to leave that to the very last thing because, yeah, I don't have the special tool to remove this and I don't want to damage it because it is a brand new pipe. So that'll probably be the last thing that goes on. Hopefully I don't forget to put it on there because we'll just uh, have fuel going everywhere. But yeah, I'll leave that till last. Uh, coming around this side, um, pretty much the only thing left to plug in is the, I think it's a math sensor. It's on the, uh, or maybe it's just a uh, air temperature sensor, ambient air temperature sensor. Um, sorry, a intake air temperature sensor. That's on the on the intercooler pipe, isn't it? I think that just plugs in like that. Of course, clips onto the rocker cover there. Uh, there was a plug, a rogue plug, which went down. That went to the starter motor. And then, of course, the ground strap that is on the starter motor as well. This small ground strap here, which goes onto the chassis leg and goes onto the engine mounting bracket as well. That's all buttoned up. The alternator both the ground and the connector that is all plugged back in. This is just the wiring for the O2 sensor. Of course, I've got to take this uh, back off once I have the heat shields on, but I'll probably do that you know, last thing before I you know, put the front end on. What else have we done? Oh, the uh, heater hoses, they are all uh, connected up. Of course, there is two heater hoses, one inlet, one outlet. You can't really mix them up. They are like the exact uh, size and shape. You know, you'll notice one is slightly longer and that'll go to the furthest port away. And then obviously the shorter one goes to the uh, closest port away. That's how they'll look. Something a little like that. I guess now then we can 
get both of the drive shafts reinstalled. Of course you need new drive shaft nuts, you can't uh, reuse these. Now I think to get these I think to get these drive shafts in place, I'm more than likely going to have to remove the nuts on the bottom. Of course, we fully rebuilt the subframe and these nuts are only supposed to be one time use, so I may have to um, either reuse them, which you're not really supposed to do, or I may just have to replace them at a later date because I think I'm going to have to swing the hub out just to allow me to get the shafts in place but as you can see at the moment the steering lock is on so I think what I'm going to do is get our new uh, battery hooked up as you can see there's not one in there at the moment the old one went dead pretty quickly and it was a good few years old when it comes to batteries I like to use Varta they are the BMW OEM what they use from factory Use Vata in all my cars, never had an issue, top top quality. And if you're wondering what size I went for, it is a 70 amp hour, 640 amps. And uh, yeah, should do the job quite nicely. I think this is one of the biggest batteries you can get for these cars. There we are then, new battery securely in position. The securing bracket is in place as well and it's hooked in to the bracket at the other side. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. Positive connected up, negative connected up. As you can see, we now have power. Both drive shafts are now in place. As you can see, new nuts installed, of course. There's the other side. It was so much easier when it comes to reinstallation of the drive shaft. When it comes to the removal of these, it was so difficult. You know, the fact that the drive shaft itself is held in by a circlip. I had to remove the engine and gearbox with the drive shaft still attached. Yeah, it was a, an absolute pain to try and remove this one. The other side, that removed fairly easy, um, but this one, this was an absolute nightmare. But yeah, I guess when it comes to reinstallation, it definitely helps when you have all nice new shiny hardware. You don't have any rusty nuts and bolts. What I've also done as well is connected up everything for the uh, for the wheels and the brakes. So the uh, brake wear sensor, that is all now back in tucked away where it should be and then of course the ABS sensor as well just held in by a an allen screw an allen bolt that goes into the hub of course and yeah I think that's pretty much it for the wheel archers I think all these connectors here are for the fog lights headlights and then probably the washer bottle things like that as well similar story around here just the ABS sensor, no brake pad wear sensor on this side, of course. But again, I think all these connectors are for the headlights, fog lights. This one's actually for the AC compressor, just there. That'll go around there, I'm guessing it clips onto something. But now that the drive shafts are in place, we can go ahead and install our new rear engine mount, genuine Lenforda of course, wasn't expensive but yeah it's worth uh, replacing this because the original and pretty sure this is the original has definitely seen better days, has a bit of cracking around the edge and yeah there is a little bit of movement in this so new one should do us quite nicely. Okay so New rear engine mount in place. Both bolts torqued down to 108 newton meters. You probably notice I have the new clutch slave cylinder in place as well. I just need to disconnect the old one from the clutch line, reconnect it, and obviously I can do a bleed of the entire system. And with the clutch pipe now connected up, it's time to bleed the clutch system. I'll also do all four corners as well, all four calipers. 
so much easier when you have a pressure bleeder. I'm just going to pump this up to 10 or 15 psi and let it do its thing. She pumped it up to around 20 psi. As you can see, clutch is bleeding now. Just got to stop once the air bubbles stop essentially. So I'm just going to retighten this 11 millimeter plastic nut. You have to actually turn it quite a few times for fluid to come out. So if you are just turning at half a turn expecting fluid to come out and nothing's coming, then just you know give it another couple of turns. But yeah, let's uh, check the clutch pedal and see how it feels. Certainly feels very light. Yeah, very, very light. But it's definitely returning as it should. But with the clutch bled, I'm now gonna, like I said, do all four calipers, then we can wrap this little job up. Okay, so all four calipers now bled along with the clutch, of course, and we've got some pretty nasty coloured fluid out. Done a full flush, I would estimate around 800 millilitres in total. Should have definitely been a full flush, probably plus some extra as well. Fluid is now up to the max mark. Nice, clean, fresh fluid in there now. And let's check the pedals, brake pedal, yeah that's firm as you like, very solid brake pedal, clutch pedal, again feels pretty light but returns exactly as you would expect, maybe it is just a light clutch on these cars, I'm used to big heavy diesel clutches but yeah feels nice. Next thing I'm going to do then is fill up the gearbox oil. So pretty simple and self-explanatory how to do it. So you have a drain plug which I've already talked up and you have a fill plug a few inches above it and essentially just keep filling until you have a steady stream of oil coming from the fill plug. Now I believe these gearboxes take around 1.7 litres, don't quote me on that, but I'm just going to keep filling until, like I said, I have a steady stream out of the fill plug. Now it's very important that you have the car, the gearbox, the engine level, obviously, so you can get a good proper reading. Now the oil that I'm going to be using is this MTF LT3. Now I believe what is specified is MTF LT4 but if you ask me there's really not much difference between specs. This should do us just fine. I use this in you know a bunch of different BMWs and yeah it's absolutely fine. Um, yeah the main thing is that we have oil in there and we have the proper amount. You don't want to be running low on gear oil. Now I think whoever you know service this gearbox or whoever done the clutch last maybe service the gearbox I'm pretty sure they overfilled it because when I removed the uh, drive shafts like so much oil came out and I think yeah it's probably just a bit too much in there. So we're going to make sure that we have the correct amount. There we go then fill plug installed now and torque down to 43 newton meters and now before i forget probably the most important fluid of all the engine oil and as you can see this is miller's motorsport engine oil this is a running in oil it is a mineral oil so when it comes to a fresh rebuild you want to have a good running in oil you don't want to use you know fully uh, synthetic this i'm going to be using for around 500 miles or so and of course we'll drain it change the filters and uh, then we'll probably use just some regular 
uh, 5W30, uh, you know, fully synthetic after that. But yeah, this is uh, supposed to be good stuff and uh, should do the job quite nicely. So for now, I've put in around four litres, of course, once the car is back on its wheels and back on the ground, I can then check to get an accurate reading, but I believe this engine holds around 4.2 litres in total. So then moving on a bit further, as you can see, the heat shields are now in place, just waiting for three bolts for the top, for whatever reason they are missing, but the other bolts, they are all in place and torqued down. I think it's literally like four newton meters, so you don't have to go crazy with those bolts. It's not gonna go anywhere anyway. But now I need to get the AC lines hooked up. So this one here, the larger of the two, that slots in here, of course, all new O-rings. You want to replace the O-rings whenever you are removing any of the AC lines. Just have a bunch of the different genuine BMW O-rings in here. Made sure I had all the correct part numbers before doing this job, of course. And it's just a few that I have already removed. They look in pretty nasty shape. But when it comes to installing them, essentially all you need to do is make sure the surface is nice and clean of course the ceiling surface and then just apply some uh, ac compressor oil this stuff right here should work quite well this is this is the stuff that actually goes in the ac compressor but of course the entire system has to be flushed and then filled up with refrigerant and oil anyway so i'm not too concerned about you know putting too much of this in there's a little bit in there just to keep the uh, just to keep the compressor from you know rusting up or whatever but yeah I'm not going to be running the AC until it's had the full uh, flush and regas done but yeah let's uh, let's continue getting the o-rings installed and get this pipe installed which I believe goes like that and then I guess those two lines meet on the AC condenser on the front panel. Get the larger of the two seated home now. Should just push in. Like I said, I have lid up the O ring, so it should go in quite nicely. Just reinstall that nut, tighten it down. There we are. That's that hard line installed. Like I said, just this other one now that goes across the front of the engine bay. Just need to figure out which O-rings it is to go on there. There's two of course. Next job then before we can get the front panel on is to replace the AC dryer. So right here I have a genuine Marley Bear AC dryer. I believe it comes with everything I need. New seals for the cap which I believe is this thing just here if you're wondering how I access this essentially this canister this canister right here holds the AC dryer and you, there should be this little cap on the bottom just used a Torx 50 I believe it was yeah Torx 50 and I've got a 10 millimeter spanner on there because it is a little bit tight I didn't want to have to take the whole entire AC condenser off of the front panel obviously it's all together it's all complete ready to go back on the car um, but yeah now it looks like some kind of circlip now I'm guessing it should just pull out then now then this circlip was an absolute pain to remove so it's obviously like a, a regular circlip with the two holes but it actually has tabs in the middle as well so as soon as you squeeze the two holes together the tabs then just make contact with the inside so it doesn't actually give you any wiggle room so you kind of have to just bend it out of shape and then just flick it out any way you can really but with that removed anyway i've just uh screwed a five mil i believe it is screw into the end just so i can get some leverage on it to pull it out because it is held in by a couple of seals now this cap Yeah, that's that cap removed. Oh, bit of oil in there. Let's see if we can remove the 
dryer filter itself. I'm guessing you're supposed to do this with the intercooler off or at least the AC condenser off but like I, said, I really don't want to do that if I don't have to. There we go, out. Just give this a quick clean out. And we'll just compare the old one to our new one. Yep, they look exactly the same. And they are exactly the same, both bare. You can see that's the original. That's a new one. Completely different colour though. This new one should work a whole lot better. So yeah, we'll just push it up into position. Alright then, so as you can see, new dryer is in place. This of course is the old one. I decided just to remove the intercooler and the hoses. I didn't want to damage the new one putting it in and it was literally just a, a few bolts and it'll give me a chance to just clean out all of the intercooler and the pipes at the same time as well. I will have a little bit of oil in there I'm guessing. But yeah, now it's just going to be a case of reinstalling this cap with the new seals on. I'll apply a little bit of um, condenser oil to that, then the new circlip and then that plastic cap can go on the bottom then. So then as you can see the intercooler and the two intercooler hoses are all back in place. Literally took five minutes to clean all that out and put it back. Just two 10 millimeter bolts, one torque screw there the torque screw on the other side then just the Jubilee clamps on the intercooler. I think we are now ready for the front panel to go back on. So, we're kind of on. So these uh, subframe leg extenders, I guess you could call them, they are now over the subframe on both sides. Of course, can't get the bolts in yet. Can't get these bolts in yet either. I think what I'm gonna do is just work on connecting everything up. So we have the two AC lines, we have these two coolant hoses which look like they are ready to fall right into place. I guess these two go to the expansion tank and then what else is it? can't think what else is left to be honest. But we need to get the washer bottle motor back in but that shouldn't be too difficult to do. Okay, and so we're getting there. What have I done? I have connected up the coolant hoses. The clamps are nice and tight. The AC lines as well, they're all connected up. Of course, we have uh, installed all new seals, all new O-rings, this intercooler hose to the turbo. That's connected up and tightened down. We have installed the two bolts on each side where the subframe bolts onto the uh, front panel. These uh, subframe leg extenders, I don't even know what they're called, but yeah, they're all now bolted down. Just need to tighten down these bolts at the top, but yeah, this thing is going nowhere. You know, it's all nice and securely in place now. I think I have everything that I need to go back in this. So it's pretty much everything you can see right here. So of course, the air box intake pipes, 
headlights, this pathetic tiny under tray, or I think it's more of just a splash shield for the, for the drive bouts to be honest. A couple of things to mention, so of course we have a new air filter, which is a genuine man air filter of course. This was the original that was in the car, it's a Crossland filter. As you can see, it's like spotless. It looks like it hasn't even been used. I think the previous owner actually done a full service, you know, before the engine blew up. So yeah, we are gonna be installing a new air filter anyway. We also have a new coolant expansion tank to go on. This is a genuine Marley item. The original expansion tanks definitely has seen better days. We also have a new cap to go on as well so yeah I think it's just gonna be a case of getting all this installed back onto the car so we can get this thing fired up now if you do want to know anything you know if you want to know uh, every last nut and bolt to remove to remove any of these items that you can see right here just go back to the early videos you know I done a full complete detailed video on the strip down you know to remove the front panel and to get the engine out so I don't think you really want to see me you know explaining every nut and bolt that needs to be reinstalled for a second time but yeah without further ado let's get all this back onto the car and let's get this engine fired up. So I know I said I wasn't going to show you anything I was just going to get the car back together but a couple of things to point out of course the air filter that has been replaced for a nice shiny new man air filter all the pipe work and everything is all back into place now when it comes to the front panel of course you should be left with three connectors on this side there is two that goes to the fog lights i actually believe it's these two right here and this one the longer thinner one that goes to the ambient air temperature sensor and then on this side you should be left with just two. There is quite a few that go to the various pumps on the washer bottle. I believe this is just like a level sensor. So yeah, all that needs to go back properly. And if you're wondering where the wiring goes for the AC compressor, it goes down here, clips into the front panel onto the subframe there, clips on again to the front panel there, there, and then goes away properly. I like to have everything in its correct place. I can't deal with wires hanging down where they're not supposed to go. I like everything to go back exactly how it was intended to. Now we can get the front bumper on. And just like that, everything is now back together. As you can see, front bumper is back on along with the tiny splash shield wheel arch liners are all back in place front grill that is all clipped back in as well and now we are ready to reinstall the wheels now if you saw the complete teardown of this car you will know that these are not the original wheels so I did actually buy another set of wheels. In my opinion, these mini flame style wheels, these look the absolute best on a R56 Mini Cooper S. Of course, have your own opinion, but I think these match the car so, so good. Now they have been freshly refurbished from my good friends at Alloy Refresh. And yeah, they've done an amazing job as always. I've also opted for genuine brand new mini center caps as well you can go aftermarket but i find they just rattle and they yeah they really just don't last they start corroding and all that so yeah brand new mini center caps just to feel finish off the wheels and they are wrapped in brand new michelin pilot sport 4 tires and i know what you're thinking that can't have been cheap yeah it definitely wasn't to buy the wheels used then to get them refurbished then to wrap them in fresh Michelin Pilot Sport 4 tyres. Yeah, cost me around eight, nine hundred pounds or so. But come on, how good do these now look? And these should perform so, so good on the road. Also opted for new wheel bolts and locking wheel bolts as well. Of course, you have to go the extra step and, you know, include these 
small little details you know you don't want to be putting rusty old bolts back in your freshly refurbished wheels do you now when it comes to the front i am just going to have to remove the center caps that is because i need to torque down these hub nuts here so of course you can't do it when the car is up in the air it's just going to spin and it does specify for you to do it when the car is down on the ground as well so what i'll do is obviously reinstall all the wheels get the car back on the ground and remove this center cap and i think this has to be torqued down to 182 newton meters finally back on the ground how good does that now look just got to torque all of the wheel bolts and then we can move on to doing the Hop nuts. There we go then, the Mini Cooper S is complete. The only thing left to do is to fire this engine up, which I'll be doing in the very next video. If you have enjoyed this one, please remember to give it a like, leave a comment down below, subscribe if you have not already done so, and I will see you all in that next one.